Okay, so this presentation is going to be on angiosperms, and so let's just get into it because it's kind of a longer presentation than normal. So the other day we introduced seed-producing vascular plants, and we, the other day we focused on gymnosperms. For instance, the example we focused on were conifers, trees that reproduce with cones. Well, today we're going to focus on the other category of seed-producing vascular plants. That would be angiosperms. Angiosperms is the name of the plants that produce flowers. And flowers is simply the reproductive structure. It's what they use to reproduce and, and to pass on their genes to the next generation. And so the purpose of a flower, well, uh, not all, well, it's to reproduce, but the purpose of a flower, the, the colors, the fragrance, is to attract a pollinator. Some pollinators can be birds, some pollinators can be insects, and, and so that's really the true purpose of, of what the flower structure is, is to attract a pollinator. And eventually, when, the, when pollination occurs, and then eventually a sperm and egg fertilize, and a zygote is created, eventually we'll talk about how a fruit forms. So all flowers eventually produce a fruit. Inside of the fruit, you'll find the seeds. And this is how angiosperms get their name. Angiosperm is, I think, Latin for, uh, basically means that the seeds are covered. In this case, they're covered with a fruit. So we mentioned that the big difference between this group three, the seed-producing vascular plants, the difference between them and ferns is that they are seed-producing. So they produce seeds, the seeds grow inside of the fruit, the seeds are covered by the fruit. That, again, that's literally what angiosperms means, that the seeds are covered. And as we mentioned the other day, inside the seed you find a couple items. You find the actual embryo, and you find a food storage. We'll talk more about that food storage as these notes go on. But that embryo will feed off of the food storage until a seed cracks open and its little tiny baby embryo leaf is able to do photosynthesis for the first time. And so we mentioned that not only is the purpose of the flower to, to uh, attract a pollinator, but then the flower turns into a fruit, and inside of the fruit you find the seeds. Well, the seeds need to be dispersed. And so often, the seeds are brightly colored to attract some sort of animal. And here in the picture we have brightly colored red berries, brightly colored yellow bananas, and so these fruits are being consumed. And what we'll see is that the seeds will pass through the animal's digestive system. In a moment, you're going to find a rather silly animation of a horse. kind of looks like the horse is doing a handstand to eat this apple. And here it goes. So the horse will eat the apple, and eventually the horse will gallop away, and eventually the horse will stop running, and, uh, you know, 10, 12 hours may go by, and the horse takes a poop. And in that pile of poo are seeds. The seeds have survived passage through the digestive system. The acids of the stomach don't destroy the seeds. The fruit is digested, yes, but not the seeds. The seeds can be pooped out into a big pile of fertilizer. That poop has leftover nutrients in it. And so those seeds have a great start to growing. The benefit of being dispersed like this, imagine if the seed simply fell straight down from the parent tree. The parent tree would hog all the nutrients, the parent tree would block all the sunlight. So by being dispersed like this, it gives the seeds a better chance. It doesn't guarantee that they're going to grow, but it gives the seeds a better chance to grow. Here we have a few pictures of uh, to droppings, to be honest. These are just uh, bird droppings on the left with seeds and fox droppings on the right. And so in the fox droppings, you, you can see seeds. And so this is one way that seeds are dispersed.
Well, when we talk about angiosperms, there's two big broad categories of angiosperms. And uh, you can see from the picture, the two big, big broad categories are called monocot and dicot. Well, they both have the suffix cot, C-O-T in them, and, and that's in reference to the fact that angiosperms grow what's called a cotyledon. As an embryo, they either have one embryonic leaf, and if they do, we call that we call them a monocot, or as an embryo, they'll have two leaves, and we call them a dicot. So this is our first category in separating and classifying angiosperms. Angiosperms are either monocots or dicots. So this characteristic is only true for angiosperms. This does not apply to gymnosperms, it does not apply to moss, and it does not apply to ferns. So this monocot and dicot, one embryonic leaf and two embryonic leaves, that only applies to angiosperms. And so in this uh, table you're going to see there's really five characteristics which we can use to determine whether or not a plant is a monocot or a dicot. Of the five, two are, I think are just more key because they're simpler. Like this first picture says, and this goes back to what we just mentioned a moment ago, a monocot has one embryonic leaf as, uh, uh, as an embryo, and a dicot embryo has two embryonic leaves. But there's a kind of a simpler way, and that's the, this key point that's about to be unveiled. If you just pluck off a leaf and look at the veins of the leaf, you can usually have your answer if the plant is a monocot or a dicot. Notice in the monocot, all the veins of the leaf run parallel in one direction. That's a monocot. But at the bottom, the veins branch out in a net-like formation. That's a dicot. A third characteristic that you can use to identify monocot and dicot, look at the bottom. We mentioned that angiosperms are vascular plants. Look at the bottom. In a dicot, the vascular bundles are arranged in a ring. In a monocot, they're not. Now again, there's easier ways to figure out monocot or dicot besides breaking open the stem. You can just pluck off a leaf. That's a really easy way to do it. Here's another, uh, a fourth way to, ter to determine monocot versus dicot. But again, uh, you know, if you have a tree, are you going to uproot the tree just to look at its roots to see if it's monocot or a dicot? If it's a dicot, you see it's got that one big gigantic taproot in the middle and then all these tiny branches coming off of the, the taproot. So there's easier ways to do this. Again, pluck a leaf off of it, and if the veins are parallel, you got a monocot. If they are net-like, you got a dicot. There's another key point, though, besides the leaf veins. And this is the last one. Look at the flower parts. If you count the petals or count the sepals, eventually count the male parts called the stamen, uh, flower parts, if they are in multiples of three, that would be a monocot. But if they're in multiples of four or five, that would be a dicot. Now, one question that comes up every year is, well, what if it's a multi What if there's 12 sepals and petals? 12 is a multiple of three, and 12 is a multiple of four. How do you know? Well, you 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 have to look some at something else for information. If if it has 12 flower parts, well, then look at the leaves. Do the veins run parallel, or are the veins net-like? So again, of these five, I would say focus on the leaf veins and focus on the flowers. Of these five, these, those two are kind of the more obvious ones to look at. And so here's just a few practice, practice examples. This is the leaf and the flower of an apple tree. The leaf shows net-like veins and one, two, three, four, five petals. This is a dicot. Here's another flower with six petals. Actually, three petals and three sepals, but we'll talk about petals and sepals uh, in a little bit. This is, again, six is a multiple of three. Here we have three petals. You can see the, the yellow male stamen in the middle. There's six of them. That's a multiple of three. And if you look at the leaf in the background, the leaves in the background, you can see the veins all run parallel. That's a monocot. 
If you count up the flower petals, again, five petals. So that's a multiple of five die cut. I hope this is getting pretty straightforward. Here's some, here's a couple leaves here, and see all the veins run parallel. So there's your monocot. So this is pretty straightforward as long as you remember those basic rules. Here we have, again, veins running parallel on this leaf, this leaf, monocot, because the veins run parallel. And lastly, here we have the veins are branched out net-like, and so this is a dicot. So keep in mind, monocots and dicots, those are terms that only apply to angiosperms. And so when it comes to angiosperms, there are three lifestyle, or life cycle patterns, uh, lifespans, sorry, there are three lifespans that we've noticed, three patterns for how long they live. And the first pattern are plants that only live one year, and we call these annual plants. Now, a lot has to happen in order for this thing to, uh, to reproduce all in one season. So perhaps the seed in early spring will germinate. The seed starts to grow. The plant will then do all of its growth during the summer months, but then near the uh, fall and autumn, it'll produce a flower. The flower will produce a seed, and inside the seed, uh, I said that wrong, it'll produce a flower. The flower will produce a fruit, and inside the fruit you will find seeds. And eventually, later on, as the weather gets colder, the, the plant will die. And so all that has to happen in one year. Now it's okay that the plant dies because notice how it makes seeds. The seeds left behind will grow the next year. So angiosperms that fall into this annual category here, well, they're, they're obviously not going to be large trees. Trees don't grow to their full height in one year. So this would be small flowers right here. Another lifespan pattern that I want to mention, some, uh, and some angiosperms fall into what's called a biennial pattern. They live for two years. So here we have a timeline showing two years here. So maybe in the early spring, a seed will germinate. Again, it just means that it starts to grow. During the summer months, the plant gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Then during the winter time, the plant will go into a dormant state where it's too cold to grow and not enough moisture, so it'll become dormant. That'll carry over, that will carry over into the second year. And once it warms up in the springtime, the plant will continue to grow, get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then in the fall and autumn of the second year, it will produce flowers, the flowers will produce a fruit, and inside the fruit you'll find seeds. And then again in the wintertime, the plant will die, not a big deal, though, because the seeds that are left behind will grow the next year. So some, some uh, angiosperms follow this biennial pattern. And the third pattern I want to mention are called perennials. They live for more than two years. And so here's a timeline that's going to show five years. I'm not insinuating that all perennials live five years. I Again, I just wanted to kind of go over the basic pattern here. So let's say that in the first year, the seed germinates and starts to grow. The plant gets bigger and bigger during the summer months. And then during the winter, just like we saw a moment ago, the plant enters a dormant state that carries over into year number two. And then when the weather warms up, the plant will grow some more. But the plant's not mature enough yet to produce a flower and fruit and seeds. It needs to grow more. But now that winter is rolled around, it will go dormant again. And so that'll carry over into the third year. And then as it warms up, the plant will grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so in this little animation here, we're only three years into the process. And in this animation, eventually, it says that the plant will grow flowers, the flowers will produce fruit, and inside the fruit you'll find seeds. This does not always happen in the third year. I'm just using this as a general guideline here. Some, in some angiosperms that are perennials, this might take 10 years, this might take 15 years, it might take 20 years. It depends on the species. But then once winter rolls around, 
the plant will go dormant. That will continue into the fourth year. Into the fifth year, the plant will grow some more. And um, as long as it's got the available resources, once it's hit adulthood age, it can produce more flowers, more fruit, more seeds. Go dormant in the winter. And then next spring, start growing some more. Produce flower, which produce fruits, which produce inside the fruit you'll find seeds, and eventually the flower is gonna or the plant is gonna die. Now again, I'm not insinuating that this happens on a five-year timeline here. I just use this as a general guideline. So let's look at the actual flowers and their parts. So here we have some flowers. They don't look very pretty yet. You're certainly not going to give a bouquet of these to your sweetheart. But a flower is the reproductive structure of angiosperms. It's how they make more of themselves. It's how they pass their genes on from one generation to the next. So what we're going to first see are the outer protective leaves of a flower. We call these sepals. Well, now, once the sepals start to peel back, and here's a great picture of it, once the sepals start to peel back, we have an inner ring of leaves that are often brightly colored, again, to attract pollinators. So, once the sepals spread open, the petals are revealed. Now, if we were to peel back the sepals and peel back the petals, we would eventually come to the actual male and female organs that are found on the inside. And if we take a look at a flower from above, you might see something like this. This is not the exact same species that we just looked at. It's just a flower with clear and obvious male and female parts. We'll talk about how I know which one of this, these is the female and which one is the male in just a moment. But now we can see the actual, um, the actual reproductive organs that are inside of flowers. So let's go into this with more detail. So let's first of, all, first of all focus our attention, ladies first, on the female part of the plant. And so if we look at this picture right here, the innermost portion of this flower is the female part called the carpel. We'll start at the bottom and we'll work our way up. At the bottom of a fl of the, at the base of this flower we have what's called an ovary, a round base at the bottom. Inside of that ovary, we see an object labeled as the ovule. Well, that's where eventually we're going to see the egg will form. In this picture, there are eight ovules inside of that one ovary. So the ovary is your, our female gametophyte because it's haploid. And notice how the word style just popped up onto the picture. Notice how there's a long slender stalk that reaches high into the uh, high up. This is a, sl uh, a long slender stalk and we call this thing the style. And you'll see its purpose in just a moment because on top of the style we have an object called the stigma. The stigma is sticky and we'll touch on that in just a moment. So if we know that this, that a flower is the reproductive structure, in order to reproduce the female part, the carpal, needs to catch pollen. And so I hope you can imagine wh what the purpose of the style is. If the stigma is elevated high into the air, better chance of pollen landing on the stigma. And I hope you can figure out the benefit of the stigma being sticky. If the style elevates the stigma and the stigma is sticky, there's a much better greater chance that pollen will actually land on it. At that case, we would have pollination. So let's look at the male structures. The male structures are called the stamen, and they typically surround the female part. Again, the female part is called the carpal. In this picture, we can actually see five different male structures that are surrounding the female carpal. The male structures overall are called stamen. We'll start at the bottom and work our way up. There is a long slender stalk that elevates the male part. This long slender stalk is called a filament. On top of the filament, we find 
an object called an anther. And in this picture, you can see actually five different anthers. What the anthers do is they produce pollen. And so eventually the pollen will be released into the air, and perhaps the pollen will land on its own stigma, or maybe the stigma of a neighbor. But when the anthers produce pollen, pollen is the male gametophyte, because pollen is haploid. So let's go into this process a little more in detail. Here we have a close-up picture of male and female parts. Again, the female part typically in the middle, the male part on the outside. By the way, if I do a quick count, I can count one, two, three, four, five, six male parts. Multiple of six, is this a monocot or a dicot? I'm not going to tell you. Look it up if you don't remember. Multiple of six. Here is the male and female parts of a lily. We see the purple female part in the middle, and surrounding the purple female part, we find one, two, three, four, five, six male parts. Again, multiple of six. Is this a monocot or a dicot? And this is a great picture, by the way, of the female stigma, the purple part on top. Great picture. You can see, see it really well here. And that purple stigma is supported high in the air by that green slender object called the style. Here we have another example of the male and female parts. The female part, by the way, you might also hear called the pistol. If you notice on our notes, I called it the carpal, and now it says pistol. You kind of hear both of these terms used. And here we have, again, one last example. Now, I'm not going to ask you to count how many male parts are there to try to figure out if this is a monocot or a dicot. Remember, you can also just look at the leaves. Do the veins run parallel, or are they net-like to figure out if it's monocot or dicot? So, if, if flowers have both male and female parts, are they able to fertilize themselves? The answer to that question is yes. Watch our animation. If pollen from its own anther lands on its own stigma, well, we can proceed with the pollination. And so, yes, this is called self-pollination. And we'll go into the pollination process more in just a moment. Of course, we might also see cross-pollination, where pollen from the flower on the left lands on the stigma to the right. And so this would be called cross-pollination. So let's go into a little more detail. Let's focus on the male anthers. Let's zoom on in to one of those anthers right there. So the anthers, as we said a moment ago, create, eventually create pollen. Well, before we get to that, uh, that pollen, let's turn back the steps and let's go through this in a little more detail. Earlier in the school year, we learned that meiosis creates four cells at a time and that those cells are haploid. So notice in the picture, we have a diploid cell in the middle going through the process of meiosis, creating four microspores. Those microspores are the male gametophytes. They're haploid. And in each of those cells, there's one nucleus. But watch the picture. Those cells, the nucleus of those cells will divide. So those one cells, when the nucleus divide, that one cell will now have two nuclei. And look at all four of those cells each have two nuclei in them. One of those nuclei, one nucleus, like it's labeled, will form what's called a pollen tube, which will be more important in a few moments. The other nucleus will divide again into two more. So you got the one nucleus that forms the pollen tube, and now you got two more nuclei that are created for a total of three. Well, why are there three nuclei? We just said one will form the pollen tube. One of them is going to fertilize the egg, to then create a zygote, 
and the other one is going to make what's called an endosperm and we'll talk more about the endosperm in a, in a little bit I just want to throw these throw this word out there so when we get to it in a few moments in a few minutes uh, you'll you'll see the purpose of it so I know it's a lot of cell divisions going on in here but this is the the detailed process of what takes place in the male anthers the female process is actually a little more complex than this so, but once the pollen grains are created, notice how at meiosis makes four microspores. They're not pollen yet. They're not pollen until the, until the next process happens and they divide again. So, once the pollen is created, once the pollen is created, the pollen is released. Sometimes pollen is released into the air. Sometimes pollen is transferred by insects, by birds. In this animation, the pollen was transferred by the air. And so we'll, we'll come back to that pollen floating around in the air in just a moment. But let's look at what happens with the female process. So here we have a great picture showing the difference between the ovary and an ovule. The ovary is the overall base of this flower. And inside of the ovary, if I were to ask you how many ovules are there, you can see that there are six. What we're going to do, we're going to zoom into one of those ovules and pay attention as to what's happening in one of them. So we know that meiosis, anytime reproduction in, is involved, you should know meiosis is involved and that the cells created will be haploid. So if we follow this picture, it says meiosis makes four megaspores. So here we have one cell in purple, but it's going to divide by meiosis to make four cells. You see how they're labeled megaspores. But look it says, like it says in my notes, of those four cells, only one of them are going to survive. Watch this next picture. In this next picture, you see there are four purple cells labeled, uh, are drawn, but three of them are labeled degenerating. That means that they're going to die. They're going to wear away. So four cells are made, but only one will survive. Well, let's focus on that one that survives. The three that dies, we don't care about anymore. Let's focus on the one that survives. Okay, the one that survives has one nucleus, but that one nucleus will divide into two. The two nuclei will divide into four. The four nuclei will divide into eight. This one cell, you notice how that one cell in purple, look how the picture changed. That one cell in purple has grown, and now it's got eight smaller circles in it. Those are the eight nuclei in that one surviving megaspore. Well, why are there eight nuclei? Well, let's see what happens with these eight nuclei. One of those eight will combine with a sperm to make a zygote. Two of them are going to form an object called the embryo sac, and we'll see why that's relevant in a little bit. And what about the other five? The other five disintegrate and degenerate and die. They, nothing happens of them. So of those eight nuclei, only three survive. And so as we look at the final step of this picture here, we can see that two of the nuclei in the middle have formed are, are going to form an object called an embryo sac. One of the nuclei is going to form an egg cell. And the other five that aren't labeled, those are the five that are going to die. Well, let's actually remember a moment ago we saw pollen blowing off of the male the male stamen. Let's see what happens next. So here's our pollen grain. It just landed on the stigma. Notice how there are three bl uh, black dots. Well, if you remember, why are there three black dots? Because in each pollen, there are three nuclei. So there are three nuclei in this pollen grain. And as we said, one of them is going to form a pollen tube. Watch the animation. One of them is going to form a pollen tube, which will go all the way down into the ovary. And in a moment, two nuclei are going to transfer, the other two are going to transfer through that tube. 
Now, how many, here's a reminder, in the in an ovule, there's already three nuclei. Remember, eight nuclei were created in the female ovule. But of the eight, five died. And one is going to form an egg. Two of them are going to form the embryo sac. There's already three nuclei in there. But when the three nuclei that are already in the ovule, when, when the two nuclei in this pollen travel down the pollen tube, that brings us to a total of five. So there's five nuclei in that ovule now. Three from the female, two from the male. This leads to a process called double fertilization. The reason it's called double fertilization is because two, two sperm cells, two sperm cell nuclei travel down that pollen tube. And so two fertilization events are going to happen. In the first fertilization event, one nucleus from the sperm will combine with one nucleus from the egg. That creates a zygote. Well, remember, what about the other nuclei? The other nuclei from the sperm will combine with the two nuclei from the egg. One plus two adds up to three nuclei fused together. It fuses together and forms an embryo sac and something called an endosperm. The endosperm will be the nutrition that the zygote and embryo will eventually feed off of until the seed cracks open and it can do photosynthesis. So after fertilization, the sperm and, uh, and the egg have, have created a zygote. That ovule will harden into a seed. And so in this ovary, I've only drawn one seed. In reality, there might be more than one seed. I've just drawn one in this animation. But the ovule will harden into a seed. The ovary, the base of this flower, is going to grow into a fleshy fruit. The rest of the flower is going to simply die. So here we go. The rest of the flower is dying, and the ovary will grow into a fleshy fruit. Inside of that fruit, there are seeds now, though. Eventually, the apple will ripen, and it will get heavy and just fall to the ground. Once the apple's on the ground, of course, it can be food for animals. Animals such as pigs, such as horses. And so the, in this case, a pig comes and eats the apple. And so like it says, the fruit will be digested, but the seeds will pass through the digestive system of a pig. So in this case, the apple is eaten. You can see it's slowly wearing away and dissolving. It's being digested. But look at how there are seeds in the digestive system of this pig. Eventually, those seeds are going to come out the other end. And those seeds, when they come out the other end, are in a big pile of fertilizer, of feces, of poop. And so this will actually help the seeds in their growth. And so after a little bit of time, a seedling will begin to grow. A young sporophyte will begin to grow. And after, if all goes according to plan, after many, 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 many years, if not dec decades, you have an adult tree, an adult sporophyte that produces flowers to restart the life cycle. So in general, that's a, a rundown of the life cycle of angiosperms and some of their characteristics. Here's just a wonderful diagram that I found that helps to summarize what we mentioned earlier. So if you want to look at this diagram, pause it, and, uh, and it makes good review. 
If you have any questions, by all means, please come on into my office or come into my classroom, and I'd be happy to discuss angiosperms or any other questions you might have.